Welcome to the behavioral sciences section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 41 to 45. So first I'll show you guys the question so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 41, 42, 43, 44, and 45. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 41, it says of the following individuals, which is most likely to currently have a deficiency of serotonin in the brain's reward pathway? So the key thing here is that we have a deficiency of serotonin, but we have something in the brain's reward pathway of which we have a deficiency. So normally if we have this neurotransmitter, that's because our brain is rewarding us for a certain action. So which individual would have a deficiency of this? Option A is talking about anxious individuals who have been in inpatient treatment for three months. If you've been in treatment for three months, this is kind of, you know, it's not a short period of time. You've been in treatment for a little while. And so this person is not going to have a deficiency. They're receiving some treatment. So likely they're trying to get back to balanced levels. So this is not likely to have a deficiency. Option B is saying obese individuals who have exercised regularly for four months. Similar thing to option A, because they're exercising regularly, sure, they were obese before, but because they're exercising regularly, now they're getting those neurotransmitters from the reward pathway because of that good action that they're taking the exercise. So they're not going to have a deficiency in a reward neurotransmitter. Option C is saying phobic individuals starting a regime of cognitive behavioral therapy. So first of all, if I see phobic individuals, I'm not going to think they have a deficiency of something. It's not entirely clear and it's not something that's really covered when you're studying for the MCAT phob phobias and relating to neurotransmitters. But if anything, they probably have too much of some given neurotransmitters being excited too much. And the key thing here is that they're just starting a regime. So if you're just starting a regime of CBT, this treatment is just starting, you're not going to see some very big change in actual physical things going on in the brain. So since this is just starting, we're going to say, no, we're not seeing any deficiency of anything. And that leaves option D, which is saying individuals with a history of depression who have quit heroin heroin completely. So first of all, if they were taking heroin, this drug is going to act as something which does the same thing in the brain as a reward neurotransmitter would do. So you get this good feeling in the brain. If you keep on taking this drug, you're going to build up a tolerance. And then therefore the natural levels of the brain's reward neurotransmitters are going to decrease. So because of that, you're going to have a deficiency. If you quit, then you're going to get the withdrawal sy symptoms and the, then you're going to have the deficiency as well. Also, we're saying history of depression, which has been linked to a deficiency of serotonin specifically. And one of the ways that it's treated is to give something which blocks the reuptake of serotonin. So you have more serotonin available in your brain and the synapses. So because of all of that, we're going to say D is correct. Yes, this is an individual in which we do expect a deficiency of serotonin. In question 42, it says a person experiencing aversive prejudice against a racial minority is best depicted by which of the following scenarios. So aversive prejudice against a racial minority, and we want to best depict this. So aversive prejudice, it refers to when someone outwardly and when they're in public, they will act as if they are not prejudiced. They're not racist against whatever given group we're talking about. However, inwardly, they do hold these prejudiced beliefs. And then you can kind of see that coming out when they're not so much in public anymore, when they either have like a small group of close friends around them or they're by themselves. So let's look for a scenario like that. In option A, it says the person actively speaks out against institutional racism in public, but when they're walking alone, they will cross the street to avoid walking past individuals of that racial minority. So yeah, um, in public, they are speaking out against the racism, but then when they're walking alone, they will cross the street. So this one does make sense. In public, they're saying they're not prejudiced. Alone, they are crossing the street, which must arise from some prejudiced beliefs that they have because in this scenario, we can kind of extrapolate that if it was someone from the same group as this individual, then they would not hold that belief and they wouldn't feel any need to cross the street. So this falls under the definition of aversive prejudice. Option B is saying the person actively avoids discussion about racial issues. No, just because they are avoiding discussions about this topic doesn't necessarily mean that they hold prejudiced beliefs. So because we can't find that link between this scenario and prejudice, we're going to say it's not one that makes sense. So eliminate option B. 
Option C is seeing the person becomes visibly upset when a family member enters a relationship with a member of the racial minority. Well, because they're becoming visibly upset, this means that in public they're showing their prejudice beliefs. This is not aversive prejudice, but it's more overt or dominative prejudice, prejudice. So because of that, it doesn't fall under the definition that we're looking for. It's actually the opposite. So we can eliminate option C. And finally, option D is saying the person is themselves a member of the racial minority and feels guilty about being a member of that race. So in this scenario, just like with option B, we can't really link this to prejudice. There could be a multiple, there could be multiple reasons why this scenario is taking place, why this person is feeling guilty. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's because of this prejudice belief that they have against this group. And also we're not seeing, you know, a link between we're not seeing a scenario in which in public you show that you're not racist, but then, or you don't have these prejudice beliefs, but in when you're alone, you do. So we're not seeing anything which falls under this definition. So we remove option D and therefore only option A is the one which matches the definition. In question 43, it says a patient confides that I find that others are reluctant to get as close as I would like. I often fear that my partner doesn't really love me or won't want to stay with me. I want to merge completely with another person, and this desire sometimes scares people away. Which of the following types of attachment style is the patient demonstrating? So we're talking about a type of attachment style is what we're looking for. So this patient is saying people are reluctant to get close. They fear that their partner doesn't love them. They want to merge completely with someone else. This scares people away. So this is going back to attachment theory, which says that when you have certain type of attention given by a caregiver when an individual is a child, this leads to a given attachment style and some certain traits when they are an adult. So option A, secure attachment. This is when someone can hold more trusting and firm relationships with others and they have a high amount of self-esteem in themselves. So they can form relationships in a secure manner as the term states. So this is not what we're seeing here. It's something which definitely deviates from that. An anxious attachment does fall under this, this given scenario. So this is when someone feels like a lot of anxiety in terms of forming relationships with others. They have much lower self-esteem, which is why we're seeing that when, they're, when they see that there are some issues happening in a relationship, they think that it's their fault. They think that people don't really like them. So sometimes... Like they really crave intimacy, approval, and responsiveness from their partners, and it can lead to too high a level, which can be, it can be seen as being too clingy. And like I said, they blame the problems in the relationship on themselves. All that falls under anxious attachment, and it's, it's all there based on the quote that we were given. So B makes sense. Option C, avoidant attachment. This is when an individual avoids even trying to get into relationships with others, but that's not what's going on here. It's kind of the opposite. This person really wants to be in a relationship, but they're just anxious about the whole thing. And finally, disorganized attachment also is something else. It's kind of a mix of a few different attachment styles. And as a child, this, this individual might even, they seem dazed at times and they might be confused at the presence of a caregiver, but it's, it's kind of unrelated to the scenario we're given here. The one that best fits it is option B, so that's the correct answer. In question 44, we're asked which of the following serves as examples of deviant behavior. Serves as an example, so we're just looking for one. So deviant behavior is when you're in a certain environment, but the behavior that you're displaying is not appropriate for that environment. So, you know, and any given behavior, depending on the situation, it might actually be appropriate. So we're looking for something which is not. Option A is saying drinking alcohol in heavy amounts at a bar. Sure, drinking alcohol in heavy amounts might be something, you know, that you initially see and think that's deviant behavior. But if it's at a bar and you're drinking alcohol, it doesn't seem like it's too bad. Option B is saying using vulgar language loudly in a religious institution. This one definitely does not match. Religious institution, we don't expect any type of swearing or vulgar language going on in this place, and this is definitely a deviant behavior. So option A, slightly deviant because you're drinking alcohol in a heavy amount, whereas, you know, of course, if you just think about it, like it makes more sense that if you want to not be a deviant 
and you want to go along with what others are doing, you drink responsibly. However, because it's at a bar, like this isn't too out of place, but B is definitely out of place. Option C is saying walking in the nude at a nude beach. No. So walking in the nude in a lot of situations would be deviant behavior, but at a nude beach, it is not. It's completely in place. And option D, walking barefoot at home. Depends on the individual and whatever rules they've set up, but oftentimes barefoot, completely allowed at home. So D, we can also remove in between A and B. Like B is definitely an example of deviant behavior much more so than A. So B is the correct answer. In question 45, it says results from a study of cell phone usage among drivers involved in car crashes reveals that compared to non-distracted drivers, those using cell phones were four times more likely to crash. Drivers conversing with passengers were 1.6 times more likely to crash. Which of the following conclusions can reasonably be drawn from these results? So we're seeing that non-distracted drivers, sorry, um, compared to non-distracted, so those using cell phones were four times more likely to crash, and then those conversing with passengers were 1.6 times more likely compared to non-distracted drivers. So what's a conclusion that we can draw? So the main thing to focus on here is that the driver must be focused on a certain thing and put their attention on it, but they're not. So they're distracted by something else, and the way in which they're distracted is different. So we're looking for an answer that kind of matches along with that. Option A is saying auditory sensory inputs are stronger during distracted driving than visual sensory inputs. That doesn't really make sense because, well, in both you're getting the visual input of driving. In the one where you have a passenger, you are getting visual and auditory. So if auditory sensory inputs are stronger doing distracted driving than visual sens sensory inputs. No, it's not really a reasonable conclusion that we can make. It's not because, like, well, in both we have audio, but when we have a passenger, there's also a visual. Okay, sure, the visual one, even though with the passenger we have audio and visual, this one wasn't causing more crashes, but it's not because audio signals are stronger than visual because in both you're getting audio signals. Even when there's a passenger, you're still getting an audio signal. So it would only be the case if audio was in one, but not the other auditory signals. But this is kind of, you know, a crazy conclusion to draw. So we can eliminate that answer. Option B is saying activity in the occipital lobe is stunted in the cell phone group compared to the passenger group. So occipital lobe, the one responsible for visual sensory information, like this is also incorrect. Because how could we draw that conclusion? Are we assuming that everyone in the cell phone group has some problem with their visual sensory information, but the other group doesn't? No, this is like a randomized study. What are, what are the chances of that? This is also a crazy conclusion to draw. Option C is saying passengers and drivers do not appear to be heavily involved in conversation. Once again, not a conclusion we can draw. We don't have any information talking about how much conversation the cell phone usage group had and how much conversation the passenger group has, we can't draw any conclusions like that. But D does make sense. So this is what I was hinting at. Differences in selective attention. So I was talking about attention, right? So selective attention among distracted drivers relates to car crash involvement probability. So we're talking about selective attention, which is saying that, you know, you're, you have attention as a limited resource and you can only focus so much on a given task. So that's when you have all these things that are kind of vying for your attention, but you selectively focus on one thing. You're focusing just on driving. However, if you start focusing on a conversation as well, your attention from the driving is slightly taken away and it's not fully there anymore. And once again, limited resource. So your driving ability is not as great as it's going to be if you're fully focused. And we have a cell phone usage example and we have a passenger, but the difference here is that the cell phone user they're just, they're, the person driving is talking to someone who's just maybe like sitting around, not in any danger, and they're just talking like it's a normal conversation. This leads to the driver also kind of emulating that, forgetting that they're driving, and also having a relaxed conversation, and sometimes they might get caught up, and then not really be focusing as much as they should be on the road. Whereas if you have a passenger, you're not kind of taken into this other situation. This passenger is more present, more aware, you're still 
aware of the fact that you're driving in a car and also the passenger can you know alert you to things they can tell you oh man you need to slow down or something they can also pay attention to traffic if you're making a difficult merge or a turn or anything like that then they can stop talking for a little while and just let you focus so because of these things and the differences in the environment and selective attention we're going to say that that is a conclusion that we can draw which is why we see a difference in the crashes between these groups that's it for the questions in this video and we want to draw your attention to our website which contains a course and in that course we have a lot of question videos just like this and we're going through all the different answer options and breaking them down in detail so that you can actually pick up the right thinking for the MCAT. We also provide you with customized MCAT study schedules and have lecture videos from students that have received above 90th percentile, some of them hit 99th percentile and some of them being medical students. So if you want more information, check out our website right here. Here are some reviews for the course. And that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.